right. I um, want to thank you for, uh, is your name Ivanka? Okay. Um, you have no idea what I'm speaking on today at all. Well, well, that's why he did, that's one of the reasons why you're here today. But um, the title of my message is Con Contesting Fear. Uh, obey obeying the heavenly vision. And that's uh, something that we want to do. I found, I was thinking uh, this old song, and I couldn't find it anywhere. It's so old. So I put it on the PowerPoint. Um, this is, uh, I don't even know where this thing came from, but it's the scripture. So Adam's going to have to keep up with me here. Okay, can you see that? God has not given us a spirit of fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he has given unto us a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a sound mind. God has not given us a spirit of fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he has given unto us a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a sound mind. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage, for he has given unto us a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a sound mind. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage, for he has given unto us a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a sound mind. Amen. I don't even know where I got that from. But it's almost as old as uh, me, and that's pretty old. <laughs> you guys are sweet. And if you're not sweet, I'm sure there'll be some sweets downstairs. So what I want to talk about today is basically it's that scripture in uh, Timothy. It was what we're going to deal with. And I thought, you know, I felt led to go in a, a couple of different uh, areas only because this is such a pertinent thing that we live in. And I, and I think it's really a factor for all the church. And honestly, when, when I first came to the Lord, the church was... Uh, different you know people spoke in tongues in church you know they would dance and i don't know if guest speakers come in and they would have problems with uh with the um tongues being so loud and so i asked you liar don't you love that i'll find it back roads all right so uh, i'm going to read a few things that um, I think will be helpful. I was kind of searching out because we're we are dealing with um, we are dealing. Oh no! Tell me you can't open that. Oh, I got other ways. Don't you love it when you have to go three different ways to get at something? I don't use notes anymore that way. Let's see if I can find it this way. Let's see. <laughs> All right. Slowly, but here's coming. I should have done this before I got up here, huh? Hey, look at that. Amazing stuff. All right. Second Timothy 1 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. I'm kind of going off a what Pastor Nick shared last week about hopelessness, spirit of hopelessness. And we're dealing with demonic spirits. We really are dealing with demonic spirits. So um, this is a, a word to us for today. And, you know, I felt really uh, led to go into, let's see what the next slide looks like here. This is uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, which was, prophetically said here as well. Being a Christian is less about cautious, cautiously avoiding sin 
than about courageously and actively doing God's will. And that's kind of what we're uh, having to deal with today. And, and so uh, here, here's a guy that uh, really, uh, during um, World War II, he was, he was a force. He stayed a force through all that. And he's actually it would be a good reference for us to, to go back and study uh, what he did and what he accomplished. Because we're, we are in the middle of things right now. And a lot of us, um, it's really hard to fathom. One of the things I felt pressured today was uh, to not, I don't want to create fear. You know, I don't want to create panic. You know, I, I don't think God wants us to be um, conveyors of panic. You know, and people use panic and they use fear to manipulate. And I don't think, you know, I think that uh, God would not have us to be, he wants us to say the truth, but he wants us to do it in such a way that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't create fear in people. You know, and, uh, all right. This I found, it's an interesting thing. I found this in... Where did I find this at? I found this in, um, I was looking up for the, um, I was looking up for the, what, what a definition of, of uh, fear-mongering is. How many know what fear-mongering is? And we're, we're really, uh, we're really kind of in that, that boat. I don't go there. This takes, us. I should have all this opened up, I'm sorry. All right, what is fear-mongering? Fear-mongering is, this comes from a, a site called Hospig. What is fear-mongering? Fear-mongering is defined as the process of spreading fear and using it to control and influence others. So I want us to discern today that we, there is a lot of fear-mongering going on in our nation right now, in our states. A lot of fear-mongering, and it's, it's, it's defined as uh, scare tactics or defined as scaremongering. And what it's designed to do is to control and influence others. So we as the body of Christ cannot afford to be controlled. Amen. You have to process this stuff. Don't get me wrong. And we're all to some extent subject to and get caught up in different kinds of fears. They, they are there. And so it's, uh, it's all over the news. And, um, and what it says is a person engaging in fear mongering is very similar to an alarmist. The only difference between the two is the fact that the alarmist will just alarm other, others needlessly, whereas the fearmonger hopes to create fear among people and influence their actions and opinions. In fearmongering, the threat or danger is either real or imagined. Now, if the danger is real, the fearmonger will then blow it out of proportion. The fearmonger would heavily exaggerate the danger and keep repeating it in order to get the masses thoroughly worried and frightened about the issue in question. Does that sound familiar? Fear-mongering is heavily used in politics and the advertising industry. Over the years, fear has been used effectively by advertisers and politicians to influence the minds of people toward their goals. Uh, you get the people scared about a particular issue and you can influence their opinions and actions and make them do whatever it is you want them to do. It works like magic. A typical example of fear-mongering is how Adolf Hitler made majority of his people to perceive the Jews as a real threat to the order of their society. Having gotten his people scared of the Jews, he was able to manipulate them by influencing their opinions, and I guess the rest is history. Um, so what we want to do is we want to be aware that it's the spirit of fear that's at work. And that's something that we have to combat. And I want to say this. A lot of times in the church, we're talking about revival. And, um, and you know, our church history has a great deal of events that have happened throughout history. Uh, um, Martin Luther, the uh, Reformation movement, you know, um, uh, different ones that have raised up uh, Charles Finney. Um, uh, D.L. Moody, different ones that have raised up and were involved in revivals. Billy Graham was probably the last one that was well known. So what we are faced with today is, uh, I think it's different today. I don't think uh, it's going to happen the same way. And uh, why I, I think that is because I just think what God is saying uh, to you and to me is that it's your relationship with God that has to has to be um, uh, cleaned, 
has to be uh, adjusted, has to, has to come to attention the way that God would have you to walk with him. And that's simply uh, what you're, you're called to do. And I can't do that for anybody in this room. So it's not like a preacher could get up and preach a sub, uh, the matter of revival and then all of a sudden, like it's just going to come on you and fall from someplace else and all of a sudden, all the adjustments, you know, all the points in your, your car are going to get adjusted, you know, your fuel, everything's going to get adjusted. And, you know, it, it's just not going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen that way, but it's as we take the steps that God places on our heart today that we will then um, be able to be the lights that God wants us to be. And that's pretty much it. You know, um, you know, you don't have to be a, a spiritual weirdo to reach the world. You don't have to do that. You don't have to. I was asking the Lord one time, because I, I listened to preachers that would preach really loud, and uh, I kind of got trapped in that one time. I went to a meeting, and this is my joke, I guess, if you want to call this a joke. I went to a meeting one time, and I heard this guy pray, and I thought, my gosh, Lord, I'm so glad I don't have to hear that guy preach because of his style, you know, his style. And it was an old style. How many of you know you hear these old preachers and uh, glory and, uh, you know, that kind of a preaching, kind of a format. And I want to say this. We were in India one time. In, in India, uh, we were preaching for, uh, on the east coast of India, and, and the power would go out. It's kind of like California. The power would go out. And uh, so all of a sudden, you realize you're sitting in a room of 400 people, and it's kind of a skinny room. So what, what did I have to do? is I had to ra raise the decibel levels of my voice so that the people in the back could hear me speak the word. Benjamin Franklin said that George Whitefield, when he would preach in Philadelphia and on the East Coast, he estimated just by the volume of his voice that he could preach to 20,000 people at one time. So where does loud preaching come from? So that doesn't mean that you, when you get sanctified or when you get fine-tuned and you get to going where you're going, that you're all of a sudden going to be shouting. There's nothing wrong with shouting. Don't get me wrong. Amen? Amen. It's okay to shout. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. It's okay to do that. But it's, a lot of it is a cultural thing that's, that we've inherited, that we've inherited down through the ages. And it was necessary so if you were going to preach, like I was in that church in Kakadata, India, and I was having to preach and the power went out, I had, to, I had to increase my decibel levels up to about a jet engine, about 120. Normally I speak, some people say I speak too low here. I speak, I try to speak up a little bit louder. Um, maybe I'm down around 70 decibels and I need to be up about 90. So I'm aware of that kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? You want to be effective with what you do. So what we want to do is that we want to eliminate the fear. We want to eliminate the trepidation that's in our heart so that we can be effective in preaching the Word of God. Fear has a lot of different synonyms. I want to say this. FDR wrote this. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Also, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather that something else is more important than fear. And that's what we have to realize today, that there's something that's more important that we fear. If, if we're fearful, you know, um, a lot of times I would go to work, my, my, um, go to work and you want to be a light where you work. So if you're scared to tell people you're a Christian at work, it's best to get that out of the way and let them know right up front that you're a Christian. Because they're going to figure it out anyway, sooner or later. So you might as well tell them up front why, so that you can eliminate the fear, Right? So you can be there and you can preach to Jesus. You can preach Jesus to him. You know, I have the privilege to work at Cal Portland. And uh, three of the guys while I was there um, died from cancer issues. And um, I, I got to lead, uh, I got to help lead, what's who one do? I got to help lead two of them to the Lord. I did one of their funeral in front of all my, all my um, workers, co-workers, managers. <laughs> and I asked his widow, Maxine, I said, how do you want me to tackle this? She says, preach the gospel. So, and he was, he, he was backslid. You know, he wasn't living for the Lord. And I couldn't figure Jim out for a long time. What, what is with you? What is with that? What is with Jim? I can't get a beat on him. And so finally he got, he got colon cancer, which is really, man, the older you get, get your colons checked. As disgusting as that is, get them checked. Because there's no reason for people to die from colon cancer. So uh, I never could get forgot Jim. What I found out through it all, was 
he was backslid. He was backslid. And so I went into the, uh, the ICU. I went with a friend. Went into the ICU, and uh, he was in there. He, he was sitting in his bed, and his wife was in there, and another guy worked with us and stuff. And so I just said, is Jesus welcome in this room? And he said, yes, Jesus is welcome in this room. So I was privileged. I was privileged to see him turn and give his life to Christ before he passed. Amen. And in his memorial service, you know, I, was, I got to preach the gospel to all my co-workers from the Woodland plant and the Longview plant. They closed them down, and they were all sitting there, and the managers and the general managers were there. And I preached a salvation message. I preached the gospel because that's what Maxine asked me to do at that service. So be right up front with people that you're a Christian. Be right up front. Get rid of that fear. Get rid of that trepidation. Get, get, get rid of it. Just, just say something like this. Oh, praise the Lord. Then they'll go, watch this. And you say, Isn't, God is good. That's all you, you're talking about people in certain lifestyles coming out of the closet. The church needs to come out of the closet. Amen. This is the kind of closet we need to come out of so that people can hear that great name. There's power in the name of the Lord. So I was working on a uh, hydrofoil. It was the plain view. It was an experimental class. I was doing the hydraulics in it because, anyway, I was redoing all the hydraulics in it. And there was one blasphemous man in that room. And he was saying, God damn it. He was saying, Jesus Christ. And so I don't know what happened. A, flip, a switch flipped off in me, and I started talking to him about Jesus. And there was guys from Washington, D.C. in that room. And I mean, the place was packed with suits, with important people. And I began to, I guess I was preaching Jesus. <laughs> that guy never used the Lord's name like that again. And that place, everybody was looking. I was talking, I, I think I said to one guy, something about um, going to heaven. And he says, I've been told to go a lot of places, but never there. So we have to, we have to be that light shining in this day. We have to. It's necessary. And you are an effective ambassador of Jesus Christ because of your personal relationship with God. So, amen? Well, I don't know how to preach. You don't need, he'll give you the words to say when you need to say them. Amen? And good things begin to happen. Okay. Oh, where did I go with this? I'm losing, I'm losing myself here. All right. Get wound up here. I think I read that one. Okay. Now, some of the adjectives for, um, or for the synonyms, I should say, for fear are anxiety, uh, apprehension, uh, care, concern, disquiet, nervousness. Those are all attached to fear. So if you're apprehensive, if you say, I'm not like, uh, what did Moses say? I'm not very articulate. You know, I don't want to go talk because I'm not very articulate. So God, God gave, um, gave him uh, his brother to speak on his behalf, but he didn't. Pull him out of the duty of still going to Pharaoh. You're called to go to Pharaoh. You are called to declare the name of the Lord. So it's something that we have to deal with. Uh, uh, other words that are associated with it, solicitude, uneasiness. Those are, are in worry. Tension, desperateness, discomfort, discomposure, dismay, distress. Distraction, panic, torment, uh, cold feet, doubt, incertitude, misgiving, uncertainty, qualm. Those are all words, synonyms of fear. It's, it's a spirit. So it's not like, um, it's not a, a person, place, thing. It's not concrete. It's not a noun. But it's, a, it's an emotion. And all of us are emotional people. All of us are. So we have to come to grips with that and say, we have to identify what is, your, what is the tool 
And here's what Satan will do. He will say, oh, like he did with Jesus, he will work on the Lord in one way, and when he realizes, okay, he's not going to go down there, he switches gears and he starts working on something else. So as long as he can get, a, get our goat um, on one particular thing, uneasiness, whatever it is, um, self-consciousness, that's another one, as long as he can get, get us on that, he'll just keep working that. He'll just keep, as long as you take the bait, as long as you keep listening to that, and as long as you agree with that, then you're going to find yourself just slipping back. Slipping back and, and just cowering. And God does not want us to be a cowering people. He wants us to be courageous. And that's what we're called to be, is courageous. And that doesn't mean that you're going to be... Oh, going to be weird but even if you are weird it's okay right even if you are i got more guys there was one guy cal portland and all the guys he was he was a he's a piece of work so i got there and every worker came up to me say is it okay for a christian to do this is it okay for a christian to do that i spent six months teaching them on what it meant to be a christian because of this particular individual's ways Amen? So use whatever God puts on your plate and puts before you, and it'll be great what he will do. Um, the, um, let's see. All these uh, words are descriptive emotions that will dictate and define our behavior. If you're not careful, you can find yourself, that will become your address. That will become descriptive of who you are. And God didn't make us to be a cowering, fearful bunch. God made us to be lights shining. He wouldn't have called you and wouldn't have revealed himself to you if he's not called you to walk in the liberty that, that Christ has given you. And you understand the liberty, and that's why you're in this place. Because it's in this place that that liberty is on display. It's in this place that there's respite from the assaults and from the fiery darts of fear that come our way. That's why we're here. Amen? Amen? And we have relief. And finally, we're so, all week long, we've been fretting and we've been thinking, oh, man, this is bad. And, man, you know, I hate my, I hate my husband. I don't know what, what it is that you're going through. But you come here and then all of a sudden, you know, you're declawed, right? You're declawed and you're going, oh, man, Lord, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have been walking down that rabbit trail. I got down in that rabbit hole and, you know, I got stuck down there. And, and so you come out again and then what does the Satan begin to do as soon as you work out these doors? He begins to work on you to get down, in that, down that rabbit trail to get you back in that hole again. Amen? And God does not want that to be a reality in any of us. So we want to have um, the blessing of God on us as we walk in uh, his ways. All right. Where am I at here? I said, Lord, I don't want to get stuck on these notes. I can do that. All right. Um, that's good. We're not there. Each. I don't. There's a, a, something that's unique about. And I, I've been trying to figure this out. Because of fear mongering. And I understand the virus. I understand the virus. A friend of mine just died from it last week. You met him. Wayne. Wayne Elkins. Sophia's death. He died Tuesday from complications from, um, he had other health issues though. You know, here's, here's, a, here's the reality of the, the whole thing with the, um, there's some facts that are really are, are valid. You know, um, if you're over, if you're a senior citizen, um, you're gonna be much more susceptible to things. If you're a child, not so. It's gonna be more like a cold. So, but the fear mongering is real. The fear mongering is definitely real, and that's something that we have to go to. Also, my sister in law died. Um, same day. She died in the morning. And then Wayne died in the afternoon, in the evening. So I'll be going over to my sister in law um, to her memorial service in January. Sandy was a devout, born again Christian, and she prepared, she prepared herself well, um, raised her kids um, in the Lord. Uh, she had her troubles and had her struggles just like everybody else has. But I was blessed. My wife Connie died on Christmas Day 2016. Um, then her brother Nick, um, who she got to lead to the Lord, died in July 2017. And then Sandy 
the last of the siblings passed away last week. But all, all of them, all of them were born again Christians. All of them were bold Christians. Amen. And they made a lot of people uh, very antsy because of their faith in Jesus Christ. They made a lot of enemies, made a lot of people. A lot of times when you become devout as a Christian, you wonder why you're alone. You wonder why nobody wants to sit with you because, you, frankly, you scare the hell out of people. And I say that on purpose. I said that word on purpose because that's exactly what you do. That's what, amen. Amen. So we want, we want to be, man, give it up. Let's give up the fear. Give up the things that are trapping us. Let's give that stuff up. Um, let's see if I can find this. We are to fear the Lord. How many of you know what that is? Okay. To fear the Lord is to depart from evil. So that's, a, that's the right kind of fear. So if, you're, if you are trapped in worry, if you're trapped in anxiety, if you're trapped in um, sin, you know, uh, God wants to free you, wants you to abandon that and embrace his liberty. He wants you to embrace his relationship. Amen. He wants you to come aside and, ex and, and embrace his joy. That's something that he definitely wants to do within you. Now, now when I think, I'm going to go back before I leave Wayne. Um, Wayne prepared himself well for eternity. He prepared himself well for eternity. Amen. He almost had a reputation of being uh, overly preachy. He was an evangelist, church God evangelist for years. So he would talk freely to people about Jesus. He would talk freely to people about Jesus. But he lived for Christ. Amen. And so when I think of him leaving earth, I'm sad for Sophia. I'm sad for Alan. I'm sad for his, his daughter Sandy. But I'm thrilled that he's with his king. And there's no sorrow with that. There's no sorrow that done well. Done well. The same with my sister-in-law, Sandy. Done well. Done well. So um, she's just strong, strong in the faith. Um, so we want to fear the Lord. We want to revere him. Um, there was a, that uh, India, I was in India with this guy's church. And uh, we were preaching. And... Uh, there was a, in India, the women sit on one side of the church, the men sit on the other side. And uh, so if any woman wants to ask her, ask a question, ask her husband at home, it's because they weren't sitting together. So he, this lady standing up in the back and Pastor uh, Yellow Cherry, Papa Ro Yellow Cherry, um, it's about five foot four or something like that. He gets to the microphone and he says, just a minute. And he says, sit down. Sit down. This is too important a meaning for it to be interrupted. What was he saying there? How important is it that we listen and hear what God is saying in this place? It's too important, amen, to be distracted. It's very important. How important is this what I'm saying today? How important is this? This is important stuff. Because if, you, if we grasp this, we have, Nick gave, I'll go back and listen to Nick's sermon from last week and get it on Facebook, on the, uh, get it on uh, YouTube. But the spirit of hopelessness that he was dealing with was just profound. Good tools, good things that were taught, good things that were taught. So what we want to do is we want to, and I concur with, uh, I was a bit shocked because I'd never seen anybody do anything like that in a service, but he was absolutely correct. It's in this higher place, in the presence of God, that things get accomplished. It's in the higher place that we get these tools, these weapons that are given to us. It's in that, this place that the weapons get sharpened, amen, so that we know what we're tackling. And then next week, my prayer is, next week, that you will pick up the spirit of fear. 
which manifestation of that spirit is attacking you, that you'll be able to address that in your personal walk with God. Amen? Amen. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do this thing that God's asked us to do. The revival that we're having that's here is involved in this right here. That's what I'm talking about. This is where it, it comes. It's not going to come because Pastor Nick is revived. Amen. It's because you have taken to heart the Word of God and are implementing the freedom that He wants you to walk in, which is not cowering down, which is not in anger. There's a righteous kind of anger, and then there's a wrong kind of anger. And we can get trapped in many of those particular kinds of things. So we want to be able to embrace the freedom that God has for us. Here's the, here's the deal. If we do not uh, determine this, um, if we're not listening, we're grieving the Holy Spirit. Did you, did you know that? That what that lady was doing in that church service and what we do mentally, we do this with mental stuff and we can become very pious as we sit here. We can have our very religious face on but our minds can be someplace else. But what we're doing when we do that is that we're grieving the Holy Spirit. And we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. Amen. We want to fear the Lord. We don't want to grieve the Lord because in the reverence of the Lord is where the effectiveness and the power of God is going to emanate from. So you have been gifted to uh, be a light shining today. Historically, the church faces great obstacles and even sufferings, great sufferings that we go through. We can quench the Holy Spirit. We can grieve the Holy Spirit in services. And um, there is a kind of he hesitancy and a fear that we want, we want to um, have. Today, there was a couple of exhortations that were given about that you have freedom to operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So when you begin to search your heart and say, God, do you want me to say anything? You're, you have a hesitancy, but you're asking God to use you in a way. Now, if that, what's your name again? I'm sorry. Ivana? If, just think what she said this morning about fear. What she said this morning about fear. So does that make you uh, any more interested in what I'm saying about fear because you heard the prophetic word and she know, you know that she didn't know anything about what I was going to say. Does that make it a little bit more um, fearful, reverent? Kind of a whoa. Kind of a whoa thing? Sure. Right. Now you know why. Yeah, but you had to say amen. You had to get up. I hopefully you took a shower too. Nobody else will do it. Yeah. No, I agree. Amen. Amen.
there's certain things that have happened in this country to make us not family oriented, uh, to income, to afford a house anymore. Uh, high housing costs that cause great harm on the family structure. It's just one thing. There's a lot of different things that are going on to, that contribute to that. But we as the people of God definitely need to get to, um, to walk with the Lord as God's asked us to walk. And it's not that hard. And I want to say one more thing. The Simon Knight song. Yeah. The guys who wrote this song. You know the history. God Yeah. Well, he, Pastor Nick picked that one out, so that's good. I think Tom said Tom said that's his favorite too. Yeah. See. Amen. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Anna. No, no, no we need to be sorry about that. Okay, one of the things, um, the reason why there's a care, like on her case, the reason why there's a, fi- a, a, a fear, a hesitance, a, a holy fear, is because she wants to be accurate. So when you, when you give prophetic words and when you go to, go to share the Lord, you, you want to be, be accurate. So there is that kind of fear, that, but that fear of the Lord is clean, the Bible says. So we need to have that kind of hesitancy, not, not the fleshly kind of hesitancy uh, and that uh, kind of permeates the church today. Um, and we want him to have help. When I got up here today, I said, Lord, one of the things I don't want to do today is I don't want to um, meddle. You know what meddling is with people? Um, I think it would be good I'll just use Petter as an example. This, this, this is not true. There's something I know about Petter, and if I say this in the service, then hopefully he'll get it. <laughs> that is meddling. Amen? And it won't work. It doesn't work. We need to have the fear of the Lord because there's things that will be said that I have no idea who God will be talking to through this. You know, I have no idea who God will be talking to, but my hope and sincere hope is that God will be instructing us because that's, that's how he works. Um, I want to say one other thing about in-gathering, by gathering. You can't get this online. Um, I was in a service one time with a guy named Graham Cook. He was teaching about walking off the map great message so I was really listening to what um, he was having to say and all of a sudden this lady started making all this noise and so I was looking at it kind of like that lady in India this is an interruption here this is an interruption so I was getting a little bit of a unholy attitude and what God was healing her foot (laughs) in the service her foot was being healed, and she was responding to the healing that was going on in her foot. And I'm going, Lord, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. Catherine Coleman did not know when people were being healed in her services. She never understood it, how it happened. I've been in services where I'll see God moving on the other side of the room. I'll just be privileged to see something going on. And you know that it's him. You know that it's him that's doing it. You can't get that stuff online. You just can't. So there is, and I understand, I understand the safety measures that we have to take. I understand the virus. I understand all that stuff. But if the enemy can keep us from meeting, you know, if he can keep us from meeting. And I understand, I got people that got health issues. My, We were going to bring... Uh, Lori's sister here last week we, or two weeks ago we took her to to the ocean and she's paralyzed 
And um, so we'll have her over to her house for Christmas and stuff, but she couldn't have made it. She just couldn't have made it. No way, no way she could have made it. And she's definitely uh, in danger if she was to get the virus, you know. So those are things, you know, that's wisdom. That's wisdom. But there's an inordinate amount of fear-mongering that's being placed on our country. Amen? That it takes us. We have to figure this out. We have to say, that just doesn't sound right. And then you have to investigate and why. Because usually if God says to you, that doesn't sound right, there's a reason behind that statement to your mind that says that's not right. And it's not just because you're a rebel. It's not just because you're, you're difficult. No, that's not it at all. But we need to abandon fear. We need to fear the Lord. And that's something that we need to do. If God, and here's the thing, if God has called you to be born again, if he's called you to be saved, uh, it says in John 6, Oh, yeah, let's look, at that. let's look at that one. There is no fear of love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So we want to do that. Okay, John 6, 44 says that no man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up the last day. You are being used by God to be lights shining and you don't even know it when it's happening. If you are fearing the Lord, amen, if you are kicking out all the wrong kind of fear, the spirit of fear, and you're, ta- you're saying, I want to put that thing aside and I'm just going to go outside the four walls, wherever it is that you go. We were in a... We were in Winco with Lori last week. I was helping her shop. Her friend Maria's husband's um, having issues. And so Mary Ada can't do her job. So Lori's doing two jobs. So Lori's buying bread, 15 loaves of bread. So she's buying bread in Winco. And so she, we were sharing the Lord with one of the workers there. And um, just started out as a light conversation. And so anyway, it got down to... Um, she said, I, I, I'm not sure we're going to get a Christmas bonus this year. And so Lori says, well, can we pray for you right now? <laughs> and um, so the lady says, sure. So right there in Winco, she starts praying, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would surprise this lady with your blessing, that you would surprise this lady, and that you would give her the desire of her heart, and then, and then some, because of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Short prayer. Audible prayer right there in Winco. Is it okay to pray in Fred Meyer? Is it okay? Now, if you're an employee, it's a little bit trickier. But yeah, it's okay to do that. It's okay to pray for people to do that. It's not the first time she does, it, does that, so she does that kind of stuff. But the Father draws us. How did you get targeted? How were you picked out? Did the person who preached to you Jesus know that they were preaching to you Jesus? It's the likelihood that they didn't. Likelihood they didn't. So you can just be inadvertently talking about the Lord, and Pastor Nick will do that in one of his sermons. You know, he'll say something inadvertently. He'll just think, why am I going down that road? Because so-and-so needed to hear what's down that road, and God's talking to him, right? That's how he works. He still, works. He still does that today. He does that in this service. He does that every service that we come together. I'm not sure you can get that online. Maybe you can. I don't know. I can't. So... We, we want to see him do that. We want to see them do it. I went back and told my English teacher in high school, Ida, Ida Mae Roberts. She was talking to us about Jesus, and the Holy Spirit began to work in my life. So after I got saved, after I got saved, that was one of the events, one of the events that happened. The Spirit of the Father was drawing me to himself. So I went back and said, I want to thank you for talking about Jesus because it was one of the things that helped bring me to a saving knowledge of the Lord. Amen? And that's how, that's how we do it. So God's Spirit begins to draw people. Uh, the Father, he says, that no man can come to me unless this Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. Saul of Tarsus had an encounter to where he became Paul. He became different. His name was changed. He scared 
the disciples because he used to persecute him. What is your D Damascus road? What was your Damascus road? I know where mine was. I know when I said finally I just, and I, w I had to be dragged into the kingdom. I didn't come there willingly. The guy asked me if I wanted to accept the Lord, and I said no. So then he looked at Connie and said, do you want to accept the Lord? And she said, yes. Well, so then he looks back at me and says, well, do you want to accept the Lord now? So I got tr snookered in. That's how I came to the kingdom. I got, and then he said, you, you need to find a church. That's one of the things he said. It needs to be a Bible-believing church. He didn't say which one to go to. He just said, you need to find a church. When Connie led her sister Sandy to the Lord, who just passed away, she said, you pray and you ask God to find you a church. And they did. And about the same week when she met, when Connie got saved, when she met with her sister Sandy, her sister said this to her, what happened to you? <laughs> she preached Jesus to her sister and led her sister to the Lord. Within a week, her brother-in-law, Pat, got saved. Then they asked him to get into a church, find a local church, which they did. They found a church. And um, anyway, she served the Lord all of her life. This was bad, man. This was back in the early 70s when we got saved. But the Spirit is drawing us. God touched Saul. He came to Saul. He blinded him. Um, when you go join the saints, there's going to be that same kind of fear, trepidation. Oh my gosh, going to church, that's going to be really nerve-wracking. How many times you invite people to church? and say, oh, no thanks. You know, they just have that, that, that fear of it. So, But man, there's, there, it's coming. It's coming. They feared Paul. Um, if uh, Paul would walk into our service, we'd probably be scared of him too. Uh, we still have, when God starts bringing people in from the world, they still have the scent of darkness on them. Can we love them if they come with that scent still on them? That's what we're being challenged with to do. What if they sit in your seat? You can ask them to move? No. Just move. Let them have it. Okay. Matthew 19 says this. If you, want to go, if you want to be perfect, sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. When the young man heard that, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Great wealth. One of my dear friends, when I came um, to the Lord, they were coming too. They got water baptized also. And uh, we had a great group we had a group of about 20 people that we used to hang out with i was a hippie and um so he started they all started kind of start to come to church and um so this guy comes in and he goes he started realizing what the cross what the, what the call co the cost was to follow the lord he started realizing this that he began to realize that if people didn't accept jesus that there's a place called hell for those that will deny Jesus. And so he had so, we had so many friends at that time. He says, I, you know, I, I've counted the cost and the cost is too much. So he walked away. And you know, none of those people that were his friends at that time, he has any relationship with at all now. None. And the one person that wants something to do with you and will be closer than a brother, amen, is calling you, amen, to be his best friend his best friend. You know, God doesn't just love you. He likes you. Amen? In fact, I had a friend in my church who used to say he was God's favorite. Favorite. And his wife uh, used to get, Sharon, she used to say, oh, Dean, quit saying that. I got to thinking about it. You know, he's right. <laughs> Amen? He knows all your quirks. He knows all your, all your ways. And he still gets a kick out of you. Think of that when you think about the Lord. Not only does he love us, but he likes us. You're his favorite. That's what Dean said. I'm his favorite. But you know what? We're all his favorite. Only he can do that. Only he can do that. And he's doing that. So you're called. You're called to uh, serve the Lord. He's drawn you to himself. The encounters that we have are individualized. Yet we count on these encounters to do warfare, don't we? 
It's because of the presence of God that we do spiritual warfare. It's because of things that he's shown us that we do warfare. It's because of things he's revealed to us that we are able to um, combat darkness. Here's what Apostle Paul said in Galatians 5. He wrote this and said, this is for, for us. Let's just read this together. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What is the commandment of God to us? Stand fast in the liberty. Stand fast in the liberty. What is the liberty? What he, he freed you by his liberty. He sustained you by his liberty. He feeds you in his liberty. His voice liberates us. Amen. His word liberates us. So we want to be able to do that. One of the things that Paul said, and this is the last scripture that I'm reading, it's in Acts 26, 19. He said, Where, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Lord, make us that people that are not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Make us be that people that are, are able to carry on as you've called us to carry on. I declare that the greatest battle that we've ever been in since I've been a Christian is right now. This is the greatest battle. Our country, amen, is at the crossroads. What this country needs, amen, is a vision from heaven of the Almighty God. And who is God going to use? And that's us. This is extremely personal. This is extremely personal. When people come and people go, a lot of the reason why the people go is because they've gotten caught up in fear. They've gotten trapped in fear. Amen? Things happen. Doubt. Always, always, always realize that God's called you to operate and stand fast in the liberty that Christ has made you free. The fear being heaped on us today in our culture, by our government, even, do not line up with the Bible. They do not line up with your walk with God. The uncertainty, being torn in different directions, all the while we're weighing what's true and what's false. We want to be, I, we want to be careful. God has given you a knower that says, that's a fear. That's a fear. And he is able to have you determine which is which. Why? Because that fear violates faith. It diminishes and silences your witness. It hinders your witness. It tears at our being a believer. It makes the church not a church. So how do we activate the Bible? The Israelites were trapped. They were get called to go walk across the Dead Sea. They walked out to the Red Sea and the, the armies of Pharaoh were right up behind them. Amen. On their chariots. They were no match for chariots. They were no match for the armies of Egypt. None at all. But what did God put between them and the Egyptians? He put a cloud. Man, his presence. His presence. Amen. Caused a distinct difference between the Egyptians and the Israelites. And then Moses took his rod and extended it to the Red Sea and the waters parted. Amen. And they walked across as if on dry land. Moses had a rod that ate snakes. God has given you a rod that eats the lies of the devil. Amen. So we want to be able to hear that. Isn't this a great Christmas message? So... Uh, <laughs> So we want to know that. They walked on the dry ground and then the waters covered up, covered up the chariots, covered it up the Egyptians. God has given you a rod. He's given you his glory that covers our backside. He splits the water. It is time to walk on dry land, saints. It's time to cross. It's time to work it out. Let's all stand. Amen. Father, we just thank you for your great mercies, Lord, that you've called us to be your 
church in the last days. As we see this age coming to a close, as we see what's going on in the world, as we see that this is a global issue that's going on, we see um, things that smack of the book of Revelation. And we want to be, uh, be faithful to you to accomplish. God, the world has no hope such as this. God, we're the hope. We're the people that have the kingdom of God, the joy of God in the midst of all it is that we're going on. So we pray, Father, for each of us, Lord, that we would deal with with those influences in our life and be strong, be courageous in Jesus' name. Is there anybody here that's never um, asked the Lord into their life, have never just said, Jesus, come into my heart? I want to be able to, to, do, uh, to say that. If you haven't, would you come up and see me afterwards? And, um, and if not, if something that you need prayed for, I'd be willing to do that as well. So God's good. Amen? He's very good. You're dismissed.